Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. It's been ages since we had a good old sit down video and seeing as though I finished my F2 year yesterday, I thought I'd go through the good, the bad and the ugly of my foundation years. Also, has anyone noticed that I cut my hair? Before we carry on, just a little introduction for all my new subscribers. My name is Esgi and I'm a 29 year old doctor I have just completed my foundation years in North London. I do vlogs about my life in hospital, life as a doctor, and vlogs of my normal life as well. So check those out and don't forget to follow me on Instagram. My Instagram name is The Junior Doc. There I upload more posts and videos than I can on my YouTube videos. So let's get right into it. Even though we've got three categories, um, obviously, we're going to start with the good stuff. And just to let you all know, there are loads of good stuff, much more than there are the bad and the ugly. But obviously, I'm going to be talking about lots of memories and anecdotes. And it may seem that there are a lot of bad stuff, but bear in mind that majority of the time, it's amazing. But to start with the good stuff, medical professionals will know this term and it's called the patient-doctor relationship. So it's the relationship between a patient and a doctor. No, it's not sexual. No, it's not emotional. It's just the, 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 the relationship that you have in a consultation. Anyways, so this relationship is really special. Patients will come in, and I've had this more um, whilst I was on my GP rotation. They will come in and they'll talk to you about the most intimate issues and problems and the emotions that they're going through that they haven't told anybody else and you are the first one to know about it and maybe the only one to know about it and although that is a bit daunting because that feels like there's a lot of responsibility on you it's an amazing feeling because it's just like you get to be part of that patient's life in a really special way um but in like in a professional capacity obviously but like they'll talk to you about their depressions their sex lives um, they'll even like in between gossip about their family members and I don't even know who they are but it's damn interesting to hear about all of the family stuff that go on. So yeah, I just find it really special to be part of that bond if that sort of makes sense. And just coming on from that as well, so having that relationship with a patient means that they have a lot of trust in you as a person, as a doctor, as a profession, majority of the time. They will trust you no matter what in most situations without thinking. And there was one situation that sort of reminds me of this even more. So basically, I was coming back from the gym. I was just parking up by the GP. I was just about to walk in and I was approached by this man saying that he had his wife and his daughter in the car and the car wasn't starting. If I could please help them jump start his car. And I was like, yeah, of course. So I drove up to where they were sort of stuck and it was really embarrassing because I didn't know where the battery was of my car. I had to call my husband and anyways, we tried to jump start the car. It didn't work, it didn't work. Long story short, the lady was really unwell. The, the husband had taken her out um, whilst she was waiting for a hospice bed just to give her sort of some fresh air and the car broke down. She needed to go back to the hospital and I offered to drive them up there. It was only like a five, 10 minute drive. And they were like completely fine with it. They were so thankful. They were so apologetic and it just felt so special. And I was like, yeah, of course, like I'm on my lunch break because we've got two hours. Like, of course I'll drive you back. So I drove them and yeah, they got out, they went in and everything. And it was just like, made me think that had I been just a complete stranger off the road, that they may not have had that trust in me. And the fact that I was a doctor and I was one of the doctors working in the GP practice, they just felt like I couldn't be bad, which is true. I'm a really nice person. Also, obviously as a doctor, you deal with patients, but also you have a lot of doctors and medical professionals around you. And those being like pharmacists, physios, occupational therapists, nurses, you know, all sorts of things. And you create such amazing friendships. And the reason being is because you spend so much time together. For example, if we're on a night shift and there's not very much going on, you are able to sort of peel away into a room and have a bit of a nap whilst you've got your bleeps with you so that people can contact you if there's an emergency. And imagine like I was, I think it was during my medical rotation. Anyways, so I was just in the room and we were all sleeping. I just looked around and it was just about sunrise. And I was like, all of these people are complete strangers. Yeah, I feel like I know them so well. We're all together in this room, just sleeping on the couches. And this just feels like so special. And if you are in the medical profession, you know that you can approach anybody and strike a conversation, share anecdotes and stories and memories and weird cases, obviously maintaining patient confidentiality. 
and yeah you'll get along so well and it just feels like this community of people that are just there for each other if that's what makes sense because everyone's gone through the same training everyone's gone through the sort of similar situations and everyone's working there together to just provide patient care for like these people on the ward i feel very privileged to be part of that community and to be part of those that bunch of people that i work with so i'm not gonna get emotional so less focusing on the job and more focusing on fy1 and fy2 it's great because you're so junior in the team you're one of the most junior people within the doctor team and that means that even though you still get to do a lot of stuff see patients um, diagnose treat you have heavy supervision because you're so senior and um, junior and that's done in a way where it's not sort of like overbearing and like constricting it's just like you know there's always someone keeping an eye on you and that just feels so comforting because you know that you can do what you want to do grow yourself in terms of a doctor and to like advance your knowledge but you always know that there's somebody there that's keeping an eye on you to sort of fix things when things go wrong if that sort of makes sense so yeah i really enjoyed being the junior of the team because you weren't expected to do very much and everything that you did was like you were praised for it um that was nice coming from that is so during the fy1 and fy2 year you have rotation so you're on a particular job for four months at a time and you go through three jobs each year so for example within my fy2 year i went through acute medicine i went through a e and i went through my gp rotations and by the time i got bored of any one of those i'd already switched over into a whole completely new like working environment new team new nurses knew everything and it's just so great because you just never get bored and you're learning all the time you're always like kept on your toes there's always some new stuff to learn new types of patients to see new specialities to sort of get your head around it never felt like a dead-end job when I was just going in and I was just working and I couldn't wait to go home because the moment I got to that feeling which I never did but if I ever got close to that feeling I was already switched over into my new job so that was amazing lastly i would say i never got the monday feeling you know that sort of dread the like sunday night monday morning like oh, it's a monday my rotor was changing so much that i'd be off on some mondays i'd be starting late on a monday i'll be doing night shifts on a monday so i never really had like a monday of the week if that sort of makes sense everything was everywhere and i'll come to talk about that a bit later as well but there's no particular day of the week that i would dread because it was just all up and down all the time we've spoken about the good stuff let's go on to the bad stuff and there are quite a few but they're majorly outnumbered by the good stuff so don't be alarmed one of the things i really didn't expect when i started my years as a doctor was the amount of disrespect i would say that i would get um, having studied for so many years and working so hard and doing such long hours you'd think that you'd always be appreciated right but no um so there's one memory that sticks with me in a &E. i was working in the minors department so my patients were in the waiting room and i was going up to call one of the patients they weren't in the waiting room but anyways that's a different issue there was this drunk guy who was like massive he was like tall and built and in front of everyone he came up to me and he came really close to my face and he was like you have to see me now. I don't feel well. I'm not good. I have to be seen right now. If you don't see me right now, blah, blah, blah. I can't even remember what he said, but I was just like petrified. I was like, what the fuck? And just as a side note, this guy was okay. He'd already been seen by one of the nurses. He was triage. He had his obs done, his blood done and everything. He wasn't dying. He was okay. He wasn't in pain. Like, anyways. And yeah, I was just like stunned because I just didn't know how to react and everybody in the waiting room was just watching this like situation. In medical school, you get taught how to de-escalate sort of angry patients and that sort of stuff. But this was like different. I felt like physically threatened and the triage room for the nurses were just by the door of the waiting room. So one of the experienced nurses, the senior nurses sort of came in, she sort of pulled me back and pushed him away with one hand and she was like, you do not speak to my staff member like that. Sit down and you'll be seen when, you're, when your time comes and you just need to wait and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, you go girl. Like she was just so amazing. It turns out that this guy is a regular and he does this a lot. And um, so then we called a security guard and he like, you know, dealt with the situation and the patient didn't even wait to be seen he went again but yeah that was like one of the situations where like i didn't know what to do i felt disrespected i felt like embarrassed everyone was looking at me and it took me a good half an hour to sort of get back into the flow of things so yeah it's not always 
glam and happy days. So moving on from what I said about having no Monday feeling, it is really difficult to basically have no structure to your day and your week. I tried to do like a few routine stuff. At one point there was like this whole waking up at 5 a.m. and doing exercise and eating breakfast before you go to work and that sort of stuff. And basically I just couldn't ever do that because I was either working late and finishing at 12, I was either starting late and like starting at like 12 or one, I was on a night shift, I was working a weekend. Like it was just so all over the place that it was really difficult to organize anything with my life and to get a real structure and to maintain a routine. I did sort of use that to my advantage later on in my F1 and F2 years. Um, I, when I was home during the week time, and when nobody else was at home, say for example today, um, I use that time for self-care and use that to basically have like me time. So even though it wasn't the most ideal rotor that I worked with, I still made it work and maintained a rough structure as best as I could. Another bad side to the profession I would say is the amount of money that you need to spend on doing exams, training, and just renewing your insurance and your GMC license. If you were to sit an exam to basically progress in your career, you need to pay that out of your pocket. And you do get a bit of a study budget, but that's mainly used for attending courses and even that doesn't cover everything. You do end up paying a lot out of your pocket for exams, especially if you have to resit them and then pay for all the resources and then also every year you need to pay for your insurance again and every year you need to pay for your GMC license renewal. So imagine having your driving license and having to pay four or five hundred pounds every year just to have that renewed even though you've got your license and it's there. But it would be okay if you were more senior and you have a decent income coming in anyway but being an F1, F2, having to foot that bill every year can get a bit frustrating sometimes. So as a doctor you see a lot of death and when you see elderly people or people who have suffered, who are much older and who have suffered things like dementia and cancers and that sort of stuff and they die and you go to verify their death, it's still quite emotional but it doesn't stick with you because you feel like, you know, I know you've gone through quite a hard time in your last few years but you've had a good long life where you've had children, you've seen your grandchildren, you've, you've you know you've experienced quite a lot what i don't deal that well with is death in young patients so there was this one time i was on a night shift and it was towards the end of my night shift because it was about i think it was like sunrise and i was called from a ward to verify death and you know that's bread and butter for us we go we assess the patient we verify that they've died and so i said yeah you know give me the ward number give me the bed number Went up to the ward, looked through the notes and noted that this patient had died from some sort of liver cancer. It's like, fine. Went into the room, drew back the curtain and I was stunned. This patient was so young. I think he was in his late twenties. And I was just like, what? I was like, no, this can't be. I, that, Cause that was, I just wasn't expecting that at all. Like everybody else who I'd verified their death till that point was like very old. And I was just like, no, this can't be. And then so I went back, read the notes, and this time looked at the date of birth, and it was. This this guy had some sort of a genetic disorder that made him more likely to have cancer, and he died of liver cancer, I think it was. And I just stood there for a good minute, right, just staring at this guy, and he had like these lovely long eyelashes. He was so young, his, he had like pictures of like his family around his room and he had kids. And I was just like, I was like, this is just so unfair. Like, what the hell? I was like, why? And it was, I think that was the moment that I struggled most with like death. Because in medical school, you don't get taught how to deal with death, right? You get taught how to verify the death and what to do and what to write in the certificate. But nobody turns around and says, hold on a second, how are you feeling? You just saw a dead body. And you just sort of cope with it and you get along with it and you form your own coping mechanisms and it's fine. But this was a completely different situation. And I left the room and I was just like, wow. I was like, life is so unfair. I was like, what is the point sometimes? And for the rest of the shift, I just felt a bit low. Um, so yeah, you do have to deal with that sort of stuff um, in your life as well. And I'm very grateful till now I haven't seen a dead child because I think that would really throw me and that would be something that would take much longer to get over. Anyway, so let's get on to the ugly stuff. 
So being a doctor isn't all glamorous, exciting, you know, saving lives. Sometimes it's a bit gross uh, and it's very gross. So I was on the ward. I think it was one of the last jobs I had as an F1 and we had to go in to do a procedure for this gentleman. He wasn't feeling very well in terms of pain, and so that meant he was finding it difficult to get out of bed and go to the loo. So he was given this like cardboard duck-like thing that men use, you know, to put their like willy in, and they pee, and then they put it to the side, and then the nurse disposes of that for them. And so what this guy did is he peed in it, and then he put it on the on the table. You know those like portable tables that like go in under the bed, and so, like over their table and they can have lunch on it. So he put it on there. So I went into the room with my with one of the doctors and we were gonna do this procedure. Um, and so I was clearing the room. So I like pushed this trolley, the urine, cause he pissed so much into this thing. He, so the urine in there had like, like swished, like, cause it swished so hard cause I was pulling the table. One, like it swished and then one drop literally flew and then went onto my bottom lip my bottom lip and i was just like what the fuck i have this guy's piss on my lip this guy's piss is on my lip so literally i ran out of the room washed like wiped it off washed my mouth washed my lip and everything and i was just like wow that's not what i expected to happen but yeah it was fine it was like if you really want to think about it urine is sterile okay it stinks a little bit and it doesn't come out the most glamorous like body part but it was fine i wasn't gonna like get rabies from it and then um i was on a &E where there was this elderly couple with a guy who's in a wheelchair and they'd been there for hours and i was really eager to get them home just because they needed to go home and rest and you know they had a long day in a &E. everything was normal i was ready to send them home and he had a cannula in his arm so i said to him let me take this out um normally the nurses sort of do it but they were busy so i was like let me take this out and the cannula inside had like kinked upwards as i was taking the cannula out it sort of flicked up and because there was some blood in there it flicked up and then a drop of blood went in my eye and i was like so the last thing i needed i've got like two hours left before the end of my shift why so i, I like popped the plaster on and i said to the wife can you hold this please and i ran down to one of the cubicles that and a nurse was in there and I said, can I just run my eye under the sink? So I turned the water on and I put my eye under and was just like running it for a couple of minutes. Normally when that happens, so that's basically an exposure of blood, um, either through like the eye, if even if it goes into the mouth or if it was a needle stick, you follow a protocol called the needle stick protocol. Anyway, so basically, even though this gentleman was really low risk, he didn't have, you know, tattoos, he didn't have any blood transfusion in the past, I don't know if he's got anything and I ain't taking that risk. So we asked them and they kindly um, agreed for us to take the patient's blood. And believe it or not, some patients do turn around and they refuse their blood taken for such situations. They're like, no, I don't want my blood tested for hepatitis B or C or HIV or whatever. And then you're in like <clears throat> a really difficult situation. Or I've had people who that has happened with a patient and the patient's already gone home. They've had to like call the patient in and stuff. Anyway, so the patient had bloods done and he had the blood sent for hepatitis B, C and HIV. And I had bloods done as well. And it's a long story, but the reason I have the bloods done is to make sure I don't have hep B, C, HIV to start off with. Because if I'm negative and the patient's positive and I later become positive, then we know it came from the patient. But if I was positive to start off with, then it didn't come from the patient. I already had it from somewhere else, if that sort of makes sense. But luckily the patient was negative and I was negative and I was able to carry on with my life. So yeah, that happened. And then the other thing I can think about was, I don't know if you guys watched a few videos back but about the sputum in a Doritos jar. So basically there was this patient who came in with a cough and I'd seen him quite a few times and we were trying to get to the bottom of why he had a cough. I knew it wasn't something serious. Um, we'd done all the tests and everything and it was all fine. It wasn't infective or anything. And um, whilst I was literally, as I was middle of, like, in the middle of writing, out of his backpack, he took out a glass Doritos jar, obviously a clean jar that he'd reused. And it was just full of his like sputum. So it was just like swishing around with like this a white, yellow sputum. And he just like plonked it on my desk. And he was like, do you need to see this? Um, like, this is what's come up. And I was trying to be kind. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, we'll send that for testing. That's quite nice. But I didn't need to see that at all. It had no relevance to what I was treating him for. 
Um, but now, for the rest of my life, I have that vision of his swishing, swirling speed chimp on my desk. I don't know why, so, but I can deal with like piss, blood, you know, poo, pus, mucus, like everything. But I can't deal with sputum and like anything that comes out of like the throat and the nose and the mouth area. That is just one thing that really grosses me out. I did find it difficult to eat properly for a couple of days after without thinking about it. And that's probably gonna happen now as well because I've just reminded myself of it. But yeah, that was really gross. So that's a summary of my F1 and F2 years. I had an amazing time. I met amazing people. I've learned so much, especially during my a &E and GP rotation. That was like a full on blast of life knowledge to me. And it's been great. And for those who don't know, I'm going into GP training. So I applied for my GP training whilst I was in my F2 year, did the exams and everything and got in. I am doing my GP training in the same hospital. I did my F1 and F2 and I made a conscious decision to do that because I enjoyed my time there so much. The team and the senior member of staff are so amazing that I wanted to go back there. I had the choice of going elsewhere. I got a really good school, luckily. Um, so I had the choice of going anywhere else, but I wanted to go back there. And I'm really glad I am because I've heard it's a really good training program. And I will be doing obstetrics and gynecology. So I'll be seeing lots of vaginas and babies amazing times um hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video do subscribe to my channel don't forget to follow me on instagram and i hope to see you in the next video bye guys